after all these years of uh, producing storytelling shows, I still need a script, I still get nervous. So um, I even have written down, hi, I'm Susie Kahn Weinberg. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I am Susie, and I am absolutely thrilled to be here at Palais of Solo um, for the Big Shoulder Stories Storytelling Showcase, our first one, and I hope many of the following. So thank you guys for supporting us. Um, I want to give you a little background. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> um, I want to give you a little background. I launched Big Shoulder Stories in 2019 with the mission to elevate the voices of the people who change communities in our beloved Chicago. And the idea was to work with nonprofits to help them tell their stories and give them opportunities to be heard. The mission and the name, Big Shoulders, hit me like a lightning bolt and I had to pull my car over. <laughs> and in that moment, I wanted to look up the words that inspired me, and I hadn't read Carl Sandburg's poem, Chicago, in ages. And I only had sort of a partial recollection of this poem written in 1914 that branded our city the city of the big shoulders. I do often get confused with big shoulders coffee, if you were wondering. <laughs> um, so I want to just remind you with a few choice lines and a little bit of commentary about the poem. So it begins, hog butcher for the world, tool maker, stacker of beef, player with railroads and the nation's freight handler, stormy, husky, brawling, city of the big shoulders. So Sandberg saw Chicago for all its strength and potential, and he also saw it for its rawness and its ugliness. He goes on, and they tell me you are crooked. And I answer, yes, it is true. I have seen the gunmen kill and go free to kill again. And they tell me you are brutal. And my reply is, on the faces of women and children, I have seen the marks of want and hunger. And still today, we see the despair, the disparity, the violence, the complacency. Yet like us, Sandberg loved this city and had faith in its strength and its pride. So he goes on. I turn once more to those who sneer at this my city, and I give them back the sneer and say to them, come and show me another city with lifted heads singing so proud to be alive and coarse and cunning and strong, building, breaking, rebuilding. So. It was from that lightning bolt moment. I had a vision of producing a storytelling showcase featuring nonprofits from across the city that are proud to be alive and coarse and, and strong and maybe just a little bit cut. <coughs> and now it's happening. So I'm thrilled to introduce our seven storytellers from seven determined, resilient organizations that work to change our communities to make a difference. Our tellers are involved in these organizations in all the ways. Some are volunteers, on staff, recipients of services, or the founders themselves. So let's get this started. Big Shoulder Stories presents Building, Breaking, Rebuilding. Yes, you may clap. <laughs> so our first storyteller is Susan Rohde. <laughs> Susan currently works at Triton College in staff development and is looking forward to retirement. Having grown up in idyllic Arlington Heights and then Schaumburg, Susan has lived in the city for 18 years and has loved almost every minute of it. Fair enough. Susan joins us tonight to represent the Healing Corner, an organization. Oh. Yeah. I, you know what? organization is very dear to her. When I asked Susan why she wanted to participate in tonight's show, this is what she told me. Chicago has enough resources for everyone, and I believe we can find a way to provide for those less fortunate. I have been blessed beyond measure, and I feel I have a duty to contribute. I can't do everything, but I can do something. Susan, please help us get the show started. <laughs> December 2022, when I pulled my Mrs. Kloss outfit out of the closet 
I had plans to help Ariel deliver Christmas gifts the next day. And the next day was just so Chicago gray and slushy and ugly. And my first task was to pick up the cargo van from this off-brand rental place on Cicero Avenue. So I put my outfit on and I went to pick up the van. I went in wearing the outfit thinking I might get a discount, but I <laughs> he wasn't a believer. <laughs> My next job was to go to Rita's house to load all the presents into the van. I'm sure many of you have had this experience. You get to somebody's, you offer to help a friend move, and you get there in the morning and they're not ready. That drives me out of my mind. Now I want to be very careful criticizing anybody from the healing corner, because these are people just like you and I with full-time jobs and families and bills to pay, and yet they found the time to get Christmas gifts for 42 families. Now with two to five kids in each family, that's a lot of presents. And it wasn't like everybody got a checkerboard and a squishy and a book bag. She, um, Ariel and her team with the Healing Corner yes. actually found out what every child wanted mm -hmm. and then they scrounged and begged and got donations until every child had the gift that they actually wanted. Yes. My partner that day was a six foot, six foot 18 year old African American Mr. Santa. Uh, so he was a huge help in loading the van and things went pretty quickly. So we picked up Ariel and we started delivering gifts all over the west side. <coughs> Excuse me. Now I swear every apartment we went to was on the third floor. <laughs> and it was like narrow, rickety stairs. There was times when the step was missing and I'd have to like, pull up my skirt and leap over the stair while I'm holding a bag of presents. I ran into one young lady, um, I think she was 10 or 12 years old, quite honestly I don't remember, but she had mobility issues. And every morning to get to school, she had to scoop down these dirty rickety stairs on her butt and then scoop back up at the end of the school day. And it made me so sad that we can't do better for a child, let alone each other. So every time we got to the apartment, it smelled of something wonderful cooking on the stove. And you could tell that apartments were nice and neat. And you could tell the parents were doing everything they could to make things good for their kids. And we would go in there with these presents, and there was so much joy. And quite honestly, they didn't care much about me as Mrs. Claus. It was Santa they wanted. So I handed out gifts, and I took pictures. But there was so much joy in the room. And it was the joy that, um, that I found most appealing. Um, it reminded me of my son, Wally, who was just pure joy and mischief and kindness. He was helping a friend fix his car in a garage late at night because the kid needed a car the next day uh, when someone shot and killed him for no goddamn good reason. Um, Somebody just shot into the garage and the bullet hit the car he was working on and bounced off it and hit him in the head and he died a couple hours later. And what I missed the most was that joy. And I went to uh, grief therapy and I went to support groups. And God bless the people who run those groups and the people who find peace there, but I couldn't stand to be in those rooms where it was hard to breathe because there was more grief in the room than there was oxygen.
But through these people, I found the healing corner, and that's where I started to find joy again. The healing corner was started by these two young women, I don't know, 22, year old, 22 years old or something, and they go into the city, primarily Humboldt Park and Gage Park, which are so badly hit by gun violence, and they set up tables in the summer near a park and they get there early enough to clean up the liquor bottles and the hypodermic needles so the kids can play. And they set up these tables and they put out food and toiletries and over-the-counter medicines and gun locks and whatever these people might possibly need. And for those few hours, there's community. There's this beautiful community and that's really the mission of the Healing Corner. Uh, Ariel does a particularly good job with um, young men in those areas to keep them from the appeal of fast money and friends in the gangs. She takes them under her wings and takes such good care of them. And that's where I started to find joy again. So that um, Saturday morning when we were delivering gifts, and by now my beautiful Mrs. Claus outfit was so sweaty and dirty and gross, and the engine light had gone on in the cargo van, and it was so cold outside, but too hot in the apartments, and sometimes I wish I had just stayed home, but I would have missed, sorry, I would have missed all the joy. And I'm really grateful to Ariel and the team with the Healing Corner, not only for making a difference in this city and helping to rebuild it, but for creating an environment where um, people like myself can go in and feel like they're making a difference. Thank you. Underestimate the woman in the Mrs. Claus costume. <laughs> <laughs> Next up is Crystal Palmer. All right. Oh, yeah. We have a friend in the house. Crystal is the manager of resident engagement for the Chicago Housing Authority. She's had a hell of a week, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Chicago doesn't relentless, so. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, she's also the vice chair for the National Public Housing Museum. Crystal was raised on the west side of Chicago in the Henry Horner Homes Project and currently lives just a mile away from there in East Garfield community. Crystal's here tonight for this reason, to help people to understand where you come from and the hard knocks that life gives you does not determine who you'll be in the future. That every time you get knocked down, you just get the strength to get back up and continue to fight every day. Wow. Crystal. Yeah, you said that. Good evening, everybody. I have to say, wow to myself. Are those my words? <laughs> wow. wow. I've amazed myself. Again, my name is Crystal Palmer. I am from the Henry Roman Homes of Public Housing Development. Yes, I am a former public housing resident. Do I look like one? <laughs> I grew up in Henry Horner uh, when I was nine years old. In the third grade, my mom put me in a program, a substance abuse program. I wasn't on drugs, I was nine years old. Uh, she put me in this program. This program taught me a lot about uh, substance abuse, what drugs do to you. They showed me paraphernalia. We went to halfway houses. You know, they put a lot in me as it relates to substance at a young age. This 
program will come full circle in my life, and you'll hear it later on in life. Um, I was a good student when I was in school. I was pretty smart, I was the top of the class. But yet, at the age of 14 years old, I became pregnant. I became a mother at 14 years old. Uh, I had a daughter. When she was two months old, I found out that she had a blood disease. A red blood disease, I don't know where it comes from, but it appears that I have some in my blood and her father has it in his blood. <clears throat> I'm very young, I'm 14 years old, I'm still a baby. I don't understand what's going on, what the doctors are talking about, how she's getting shot and getting blood transfusion. They're doing all kinds of stuff that I don't understand. I can't comprehend because I'm a child. My mother, I guess she didn't understand either. This is the first time she's ever had to experience something like that. So I guess she didn't know how to talk to me about all these things that were going on. By the time I'm 16 years old, I have another child by the same young man, and she has the same disease. So I got this double whammy. I got two babies, very ill, in and out of the hospital, you know, living life the best that they can. By the time my daughter is nine years old, my, order, my oldest daughter is nine years old, she passes away. Now I told you, I did not understand, because I'm a child, what was going on in my life as I take her back and forth to the doctor for treatments, you know, just every time she got sick, just back and forth to the doctor. Now she passes away. I heard that at one point in time, you know, maybe my mother and my aunt was talking and they said that she would probably live till she uh, was 14 years old. Well, she passed away at nine. I was messed up, I was devastated. Yet still did not know how to express myself, how I was supposed to feel. I just knew I was sad, I was hurt, I was depressed. And I still got a sick kid that I still have to do the exact same thing for. Well. She passes away. A few years later, my rock, you know, she passes away. That's my mom. She's my rock. This lady believed in me. She told people stories about me, how I was going to be this great person, right? How I was going to be, I was so smart that I could do anything. She passes away. But through all of this, of me not understanding my feelings, not understanding what's going on with me, what, what do I gravitate to? told you the substance abuse program was going to come back into my life, right? I started using um, drugs myself as a way to cope with those feelings and emotions that nobody could tell me what they were or how to deal with them or has somebody else been through this and tell me how you, you managed to work through it. Nobody could tell me that. So I started using drugs myself. Well, my grandmother passes away a year later. It's over for me now. I have to put on my big girl shoes and get in there and take care of my family because my mom's gone, my grandma's gone. Who's going to take care of the family? My family, my siblings, they are all, you know, we're all out messed up because we probably going through the same thing but don't know how to express it. So we're all using drugs just to deal with the pain. So when my grandma dies, I'm like, I got to get this right, guys. I go into recovery came back full circle to this program, this substance abuse program that I had went to when I was nine years old. Went there, got a recovery. Behold, my brother and sister, they seen me, seen my life getting better, and they wanted their life to get better, and they wanted the treatment too. There were many times that we were in the same room, in the same space, talking the same story, trying to get rid of that pain, trying to relieve some of that stress and pain that had been on us ever since we were a child. Well, one day I was looking for a job. I went back to my old home, Henry Warner. I went there. Uh, they were hiring at the management company, but if something happened as I was walking over to the management company. There was this dark cloud like over my head. And I'm like, wow, why is this dark cloud over my head? And I seen a friend who I had, uh, was raised up where I seen her and she was dark. And I said to myself, I was talking to God, I was like, God, did I look like that? And he said, yeah. I said, well, God, why do you have me back here? 
He said, I have you here so that you can show others, your peers, that they can come to and they can be washed white as snow. Because mind you, me living in that community, when I got myself sober, a lot of people didn't know who I was. And I always say God has washed me white as snow. Those people did not comprehend this was the same person. So I became an advocate for my community. I ran for a local advisory office. The first time I ran for treasurer, the second time I ran for president. Uh, as president, I won by two votes. I, I beat a person that had been in office for 32 years by two votes. The National Public Housing Museum was introduced to me at the table with those local advisory council members by Sunny Fisher. She said that we wanted to build a public housing museum that could tell the story of public housing, of all the training and all the pain and all the hurt and all the obstacles they had to go through. A place where we can tell those stories. So she vetted me out, like, I need you, Crystal, on this team to be the voice, to be the face of public housing, to show people that public housing residents they have a hard time, just like anybody else has a hard time. But they can stand up, get through those struggles. I stand here today. I stand here today representing my community, representing public housing residents, representing the National Public Housing Museum. The museum will be here to tell the story of the good, the bad, and the ugly of families that have been through public housing. And they, you don't have to come from public housing to have been through all these obstacles, but it will tell the story of our lives, our families, and how we made it through those hard times. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal. Your, your story is truly a Chicago story. Um, it is so right that the National Public Housing Museum has chosen Chicago as its home. It's national, not the Chicago story. It's the story of our country. And um, I um, and I'm so glad that they found you. So um, we'll look forward to the grand opening. The museum is going to be in the Jane Addams Homes on the Near West Side, and it's opening this year. So we'll look forward. To it. Thank you. Thank you. is Giovanni Scumacci, who is a senior at Curie Metropolitan High School. He's on the wrestling team, and he's in the National Honor Society. And let me remind you, he is a second semester senior. <laughs> on LinkedIn, Giovanni's profile simply says, hungry for opportunity, and I'm totally going to steal that. That's what more is there to say? That's perfect. Um, he is currently a Chicago scholar and a Chicago scholar ambassador, so he works to promote the program to high schools and colleges. And Giovanni has applied to college for admission next fall, and now is in that very fun waiting period. Um, Chicago Scholar's mission is to support Chicago's future leaders by helping students to apply, get in, graduate, and launch their careers. And here is one of them now, college-bound and very ready for it. Giovanni? Um, my voice is completely gone. As she mentioned, I'm a wrestler. I just got back from a tournament, but you know, the show must go on. There's no stopping. Is it better? Yeah. Yep. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Susie. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as previously mentioned, I am a senior currently attending Curie High School, but I would like to take you all back to my sophomore year. Just released from a pandemic lockdown, a young Giovanni was being exposed to so many different places, people, things, all types of proper nouns. Uh, and in all honesty, the year was going great. New friends, and it kind of felt like a new life. But that wasn't until I made one of the worst decisions of my life. See, I don't believe in regret. But as the door shattered under the force of my kick, and I seen all that glass falling down, I definitely started to question my beliefs, to say the least. I jumped up the stairs, and I stumbled over the pile of glass as it crunched right under my feet. I turned sharply around the corner, and I hurled my body towards the vacant lunchroom as tears poured down my cheek. Out of the corner, 
I clenched my fist and stopped in my sleeve. I felt like I felt like such a little boy. The little boy I used to be. Bruised fingers and bloody knuckles. Drywall lingering on my clothes. As my walls riddled with holes, I was fun to work. Despite despite <laughs> despite the boy's anger and the frustration and his responsibility, his teeth still grinded in frustration as pillows and covers uh, pillows and covers smothered his face as he gasped for every breath. I thought I had navigated my way around these childish acts which plagued my childhood, but what remained of the shattered door begged to differ. I peered up from my sleeve as radio static filled the room, and I seen the dean pace towards me, and I knew that I was absolutely doomed. And by the time I reached my office, my mother was already there seated with tears streaming down her face. I couldn't even muster the courage to look at her. And as we approached the car, I couldn't even get in the passenger seat. And now here I am, sitting in the back seat, a victim to shame's trouble. I felt so selfish. I couldn't believe the pain I put my mother through due to my immaturity. I've always been reminded time and time again that you are a reflection of your parents. And this is not who my mother was, nor is this how she raised me. She showered me with unconditional love and support all my actions. This didn't reflect her in any way, shape, or form. I knew I needed to make a life-altering change because I see myself traveling in a direction that leads to a cycle that I've been surrounded by time and time again. That night, I wrote her a letter apologizing for all of the destruction, past and present. I expressed how grateful I was to have her by my side and that I would never let her down again. It was time to show the world the bright young man that she was responsible for raising me. Days later, after a paid vacation from school, <laughs> extend, extended lead, you know, uh, I found myself taking deep breaths as the, tower, as the building towered over me. The bitter morning breeze pierced my jacket and poked at my lungs while I marched to school with my head held high. I was determined to right my wrongs, and after standing in, I headed straight from Dean's office. I owed them all a formal apology and expressed my plans to redeem myself. And from then on, I began to salvage my sophomore year. I worked overtime to raise my grades, and by the end of the year, I was exceeding in every single one of my classes. I felt so bad for me. So much so, uh, uh, I craved a curriculum that would push me further than my regular classes were. I knew I was capable of much, much more, and even though I was nervous, as junior schedule programming came around, I found myself marching into my counselor's office, determined to face the challenge head on once again. And thanks to the recommendations from my teachers, I was accepted into every advanced placement class I applied to. And as the months passed, I found myself thriving in an academic weapon, if, if you so. <laughs> I adopted the mantra, you know, how you do one thing is how you do everything, and I live by it. I refuse to perform anything less than my highest capability, and I refuse to give anything less than my all. And now, I find myself in front of this wonderful, wonderful crowd telling the story of the man I became. And this, but this change of character did not happen overnight. It was, it was a long, long road. And it was very far from easy. But through adversity, I truly feel that I was saved. I am no longer that little boy I once, once was, but he will always have a special place in my heart. <laughs> I imagine him sleeping peacefully through the night, tears far, far away from his eyes, and pillow under his head rather than his face. And I like to think he's proud of how far we came together. And now, as I find myself a senior in high school working on college essays and whatnot, everyone wants the spotlight on me. Case in point. <laughs> <laughs> how I overcame hardships and how I persevered through struggles and how I toppled these generational curses. And as triumphant as that sounds on paper, truth be told, that is not the case. I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for my mother. And I wouldn't be the man I am today in front of you all without my amazing father. And I wouldn't be up here representing Chicago Scholars if it weren't for the individual input from each and everyone who had put their faith in me before I had found mine, and who believed in me before I believed in myself. Right, yeah. <laughs> and as much as the universities must be dying to hear me, 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 I am far from a liar, and I was not raised that way, and I refuse to flake my mother like that ever again. <laughs> Everything I do is for them. Everything, I promise. And so these days, as I walked through that door, that fateful door, that door that changed it all, 
I see that I have been reconstructed in them. I sit and admire its beauty. The stainless steel finish, the stainless steel finish glimmers, and its glass interior shines my reflection right back at me. I take myself to the bottom of the steps, gazing in its direction, and with each and every stair, I reflect upon how different life was just a couple years ago. The higher I climb, the more my reflection slips and fades away until I reach the top flight. At this point, the door is completely out of sight, and I exit the stairwell, holding my head hella high, grateful for my journey, and determined to continue making my family proud, for the door, too, has been reconstructed anew. Thank you. Wow. Not the way you hear it, 
but the way other people hear it. Then I found it impossible, so I gave up. I considered my voice useless, and I started looking at other ways I could be a better speaker. I have a saying, where stubbornness fails, oh, sorry, the other way around, where talent fails, stubbornness prevails. <laughs> so I started watching public speakers on YouTube through middle school and elementary school. I borrowed President Obama's famous pause to help slow myself down. <laughs> I used my hands to gesticulate. I used props when appropriate. I didn't look at my notes. I looked at my audience. Above all, I tried to make my speeches interesting. Because even if I was tough to understand, if my speeches were interesting, I was hoping people might try. Mm. In all that time, though, I didn't hear my actual speech improve. And I got to thinking, why am I doing all of this? Am I doing it because I'm ashamed of who I am? Or am I doing it because I know what I'm capable of with a bit of effort? So I came to the conclusion. I had to start listening to my voice. Not the way other people heard it, not even the way I heard it. That's the good part of it. <laughs> not the way other people heard it, not the way I heard it, but the way that it was. The good, the bad, the fast, the slurred. And so, through middle school and high school, I started doing the things I loved and hated the most. Speak and listen. I always chose presentations over essays. I would run for positions I didn't even want because they gave me an opportunity to speak in front of a crowd. When those opportunities ran out, I made my own. I started a speech and debate team at my high school. Through all of that, I started to get more comfortable. Something I didn't realize before I was asked to speak here for Big Shoulder Stories by Literacy Chicago was this path that brought me to, well, this rug. <laughs> uh, at Literacy Chicago, I tutor a woman named Crystal and Matt. If you asked me before this how I found that opportunity, I would have said I Googled Literacy Chicago, or sorry, Chicago Math Volunteers, and it was like the third link. Some background. Uh, Crystal has been taking adult uh, literacy language courses at Literacy Chicago for a number of years, but she really wanted to learn math. To her, math was the key to getting a good job and just having a better life. But also to her, math was like an entirely different language with its own logic, its own structure, its own symbols. And it never felt quite right. But she wanted to learn math really, really badly. And over the last five years, she's gone from number lines addition, subtraction, and now even basic multiplication. So again, um, if you asked me before how I ended up here, I would have said it was chance. After all this, I can't think of a different way to invent it. Even now, uh, the easiest way to make me cringe is by playing me a recording of my own voice. I have a list of words that under no circumstances am I going to say. <laughs> but that list grows shorter and shorter every year. And it's not because I'm improving. It's because every year I'm becoming more and more comfortable in my own voice. Thank you all so much. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, it's a good time with you. That's awesome. Um, thank you for that. All right. Next up is Tanisha Peoples. Um, Tanisha is the founder and CEO of the Roots Initiative, a self-proclaimed comedian, old soul DJ, and a June Cancer. And she probably, oh, probably, probably hails from the Anglewood community. All right. Um, her passion drives her in uplifting and amplifying the voices of those that are so often ignored, specifically in public education. 
And Tanisha's work has been featured in um, Blavity, am I pronouncing that right? Ebony Magazine, The Black Wall Street Times, and Chopsky. She's been recognized as a mover and shaker with Black Minds Matter. And while Tanisha isn't sure she'll see the change she's fighting for during her lifetime, she is committed to going down trying. And in my opinion, you have the perfect name, Peoples, <laughs> for all the work you do. So please come on up. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay. I just want to shout out to Sanji real quick. I also have a speech impediment, so you are truly an inspiration. Mm. Um, and <laughs> I want to be like you. Okay. <laughs> Y'all, I might walk around too, so I hope y'all can hear me in the back. <sighs> On August 14th, 2021, I came home with some groceries, excited to make myself a sturdy Sunday dinner. As I was unpacking my oxtails and beer, I received a frantic call from my aunt. Andre's been shot. Can you get to the University of Chicago, she cried. What she was saying didn't make sense at first. When she said Andre, I thought she was talking about her older son that's been in Minnesota for years. Then it dawned on me that she was talking about her grandson and my 15-year-old cousin. I immediately hopped in my car and as I sped down to Bishop Ford, my aunt called again. Her voice trembling in agony and disbelief, she whispered, he's gone. Tears of sadness and anger streamed down my face as I continued to drive. Feeling like I it was taking hours to get to the hospital, my mind wandered to how I could have just come from a back to school event, encouraging those kids to be their best selves and learning that my little cousin had been killed all in the same day. And for the thousandth time, I questioned my purpose because why was I assigned this thing that felt so defeating and traumatizing? Finally, I arrived at U of C to find my family members mourning the loss of yet another loved one. Another loved one. This loss hit different, and it took me a while to figure out why. As a matter of fact, it didn't become clear until close to the end of my initial call with Susie a few months back when we were discussing Big Shoulder stories. And when the why hit, it hit me. Andre was a victim of spear murder. Spear murderings when a series of consistent and calculated assaults are launched against a group of people for the sole purpose of diminishing their will to live and thrive. This spirit murdering occurs in the name of power, oppression, and white supremacy. It's intergenerational, individual, collective, and it ravages entire communities. So basically, <coughs> Someone who was convinced that their life wasn't worth anything projected that anger onto Andre and took his. After our call, I started putting the pieces together. I realized that Andre's tragedy was the latest mirror lined up against the dark wall of others that portrayed a lifetime of my own spirit murdering. Subconscious thoughts of feeling unworthy, hopeless, complacent, insecure, and seemingly making endless, exhausting strides towards other people's impossible standards of perfection. It was everything designed to destroy potential, purpose, genius, joy, and most importantly, discourage and thwart liberation. And it's not that I was told that I could be successful, right? Live up to purpose, potential, etc. It was because I was a black girl that grew up in Inglewood. Almost everything I saw being done or denied to our community and everything that had been done or denied to our ancestors had been oppressed upon my spirit since the day I came into this world. And it had been persistent and persuasive every day since, until now. <sighs> Losing Andre forced me to focus inward more intentionally. I knew I had to work to finally shatter these ugly mirrors and get free. And in doing that work, I found the answer to my question that day in the car, why me? In my own healing and spirit revival, my purpose and mission is to support others in shattering the mirrors that, that reflect fallacious and manipulated perceptions of self. 
because I can't be completely free until we're all free. And living a full life is living a free life. Yeah. I wrestle with sharing this story because these days, I try not to amplify traumatic events or trigger anyone else's memories of loss. So in the spirit of love and life, light, I'd like to leave everyone with a few things. Andre's spirit lives on in the love he had for his family and the love we will forever have for him. His memory will not be lost in or summarized by a tragic headline. And his genius is celebrated and commemorated in the Roots Initiative. For Andre and others that have lost their lives as a result of spirit murdering, it is our responsibility to avenge their genius, their potential and purpose, and by living and thriving fully and authentically in our lives. It is our responsibility and mission to be free. And to everyone within the reach of my voice, especially other black and brown people whose mirrors have been stained by the, ugly, by the world's ugliness, I see you. I see us. We are wonderfully made, beautiful, talented, and one day soon free. Amen. Thank you. she's doing, the difference she's making. Beautiful. And I wanted you to know I was introduced to Tanisha by our mutual friend Nicole Johnson, who I met through Chicago Scholars. Y'all see what's happening? <laughs> see why we're here? Yes. These organizations don't necessarily have anything to do with each other or with me until today. Now we're family. Oh my gosh. And you guys, no, you guys, <laughs> Zachary is a third, did I nail it? Zachary, <laughs> he practice. He's third generation Ukrainian American born and raised in the suburbs of Chicago. The former Fulbright scholar and journalist, he worked and studied in Ukraine for several years. He currently works at Refugee One as their communications manager, helping to tell the stories of refugees and the impact they are having on the community around them. Zachary, please join us. Many people ask me, what do you do at your job? What do you do at Refugee One? And really, my job there is mainly to listen. To listen to stories. And not just any stories, but some of the most intense and unimaginable, unimaginable stories I've ever heard in my life. Refugee stories. Stories that showcase the best and the worst that humanity has to offer. And in a lot of ways, in this job, it is the most uplifting and hardest job I've ever done. Tonight, I'd like to tell you my story of how I ended up in this job. I come from a family of refugees. My grandparents were from Ukraine. They had to flee in the waning days of World War II as the Soviets swept through the country. They were displaced, scattered across the world, and told to start again. Who they were before that time mattered little to the people in the country that they lived in. But throughout it all, they held on to what they had. Traditions, their heritage, their culture, the language. And most importantly, the stories. Stories of their life and of the war. And they pass these down to their children and to their grandchildren. That would be my brother and I. And from a very early age, I learned to cherish stories. In February of 2022, history repeated itself. War had again come to Ukraine. And so, at that time, I decided independently to go and to do my part. Alongside my brother and a driver, we crossed the border into Ukraine, traveling by van to the city where my relatives lived. And at that time, 
we were a part of an initiative to deliver critically needed medical supplies. Little did I think visiting that town, which I had seen so many more times in my life, with its quaint cafes, with its European architecture, cobblestone streets, did I think that it would be a war zone. And it felt like it. There was this dark, looming shadow that seemed to follow us wherever we went. This threat. Maybe it was because the city we were in had been hit by a missile. And I got to see with my own two eyes the smoke that billowed up like a dark mountain in the distance. However peaceful that city had once been, every day I was there, there was this small little creeping thing in the back of the mind that said, any day could be your last. Two weeks flew by. We did what we came to do. We were successfully able to deliver medical supplies to those who needed it. And now we had a new mission, getting out. Surprisingly, it was a lot easier than getting in, at least for us. We just had to cross the border, show some documents, go to the checkpoint, and that would be it. We merged into a long line waiting it was of women, children, and old men. And this line just shuffled forward, and my eyes wandered. And I noticed that there were very few men at all in this crowd, very few fathers, very few young men. It was mostly old babushkas with their little headscarves and a lot of luggage. Maybe you might see a couple of those, a um, couple of babushkas here in Chicago in Ukrainian village. But when I saw that, I couldn't help but think of my own grandparents and how they had to flee their country as refugees. I thought to myself, after all that, once I make it out of here, I will live. And I will thank God for every day of my life. Of course, I would give my mom a big hug. The border post doors were now just a minute away, a couple of families ahead of me, and we were almost across. And that's when I saw something I could not forget. He was a father with his family. Typical looking Eastern European man. And he was hugging his wife for what seemed to me like the last time in his life. His little son was right there crying. He didn't understand why they had to separate. Because that family, that mother and child, they went through the doors. They were able to leave, but he wasn't. You see, he was a fighting age, so he could not leave his country. And there was something in that moment, hearing those tears, the little boy saying, Papa, that broke my heart. As I passed through those doors to greet the neatly dressed customs officer, I felt guilt. I felt guilty that I could leave this war behind and others could not, just because of my past days. And so I decided, once I got home, I would change something. I would help people. I would do what I could to make the world a little bit better. And so I put away my past. And today, that's exactly what I try to do. Right now, in the world, there are 110 million forcibly displaced people. This number has tripled in the past 10 years. It is only going up. But, as grim as that is, let me tell you that walking alongside refugees, working with refugees, has not only helped them in a very tangible way, but it has transformed me. You know, we are in this cycle of building, breaking, rebuilding. And I want you all to know that you don't need to go to a war zone to make a difference in this world. You don't need to do anything that intense. I want you all to realize that here in Chicago, yeah. you have all the power you need to help those who are starting again. Thank you all. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, exactly, beautiful. All right, we're, I'm, we have one more storyteller. I know we're running over, but you all, 
Um, next up is Vondale Singleton. He is the founder and CEO of Chance Male Mentoring. I want, I want to read his whole bio, but I want you to hear him. Um, he he does so much. And go on the website. And, you're so amazing, Vondale. You come up here. I, I want to shout. <laughs> So picture it, Chicago South Side, early 1980s. The city was alive with the rhythm of life, but for my younger self, it was a tough terrain to navigate. See, my mother was 15 and my father was 17 years old. Out of B. Wells Housing Projects, 514 East 36th Street, apartment 202 to be exact. Raised in the midst of adversity, I faced challenges that no child should bear. Trauma was an unwelcome companion, and the streets were an unforgiving teacher. Yet, in the midst of darkness, there was a flicker of resilience that would one day ignite a transformative flame. Yeah, as the years unfolded, life presented its harshest blows. In 1994, at the tender age of 14, I experienced the heart-wrenching loss of my mother who struggled with the crack cocaine addiction. My father was incarcerated and the world suddenly became a cold place and the challenges seemed insurmountable. Gentrification happened and we were forced to leave the cold bricks of the Ida B. Wells to head over to Stateway Gardens on 35th Street and eventually to 71st and Crandon on the east side of Chicago. After enduring loss after loss, something happened that changed the trajectory of my life. God answered the unspoken prayer of this little boy that had lost hope. That I would make a difference and I will sense destiny upon my life. This is where my life changed. It was the summer of 1997 through my friend Brian Jackson who invited me to apply at the Sam Overbound program at Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Milwaukee in here? Thank you for the two of y'all. I was living with a family friend, the McGee family. It had been three years, my mom had passed away when I was introduced to the man who would change my life forever, Stephen Ray Robertson. He entered my life, he offered not just guidance, but a ticket to a world beyond a world I never imagined. It was a trip through the Overground program, and we flew to San Francisco, California to visit UC Berkeley, Stanford University, the Pier 39. It was a trip that would prove to be the catalyst for a loft. At this time, I'm 17 years old and about to be a ward of the state. And it was my very first time flying on a plane. And it would be an opportunity that I never dreamed of. A world where palm trees swayed against the backdrop of possibility. The sight of a palm tree might seem mundane to many. But for me, it was the only way that I ever saw a palm tree was revealed in an encyclopedia. It was our internet before the internet. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it was a life beyond struggle. It was a life with exposure, experiences, and opportunities. It was an embrace of San Francisco's palm lined streets that I discovered the power of exposure. Fueled by the newfound understanding, I returned with a purpose burning brightly within me because I realized that mentoring coupled with the power of exposure equals transformative lives. It could reshape the narrative for countless young men facing similar circumstances as myself. And so, when we got back on the trip, that mentor asked me, he said, how was the trip? 
I was too cool for school, y'all. I was like, it was all right. <laughs> but really, I was ecstatic that I had a chance to fly on a plane for the very first time and had the opportunity to see a real palm tree. He then asked me a question. Have you ever thought about going to college? I said, no. Steve would begin to water that seed through his continual mentorship of love support and continued exposure. I eventually went to college. And I remember four years later, while getting ready to graduate, conversing with the same mentor on the phone, realizing that I was about to become the first one out of my family to graduate from college. <laughs> so I picked up the phone and called Steve. And I said, Steve, what do I need to do to pay you back for what you've done for me? And after a quiet gasp, he said, the same thing I did for you, do for somebody else. So I was already declared an education major and just to pay it forward, just like he did. So after 10 years of teaching and eventually becoming an assistant principal, I wanted to deepen my impact by the providence and the direction of God. Champs Mentoring was born, a vessel of change, a conduit of hope at Gary Comer College Prep. Through Champs Mentoring, where we aim to educate, empower, and expose boys and young men of color beyond the four walls of the school, surrounding them with the potential to unlock their dreams so that they can be realized. The palm trees of San Francisco became a metaphor for the possibilities that lay beyond the horizon. Through Champs, Young men are not only mentored, but are taken on journeys that exceed their wildest imaginations. From being celebrated in East Wing of the White House at the invitation of President Barack Obama, or meeting with executives at Nike in Beaverton, Oregon at the Michael Jordan Building, or experiencing the vibrancy of Dubai's Burj Khalifa, or the desert at the Safari, or what about the Buckingham Palace in London, the Eiffel Tower of Paris, or even visiting the Great Wall of China with mega superstar Dwayne Way. Or what about the South Side of Chicago where we host a Born to Win annual conference every single year? Yeah, yeah. We never thought that these were possibilities. Today we stand witness to the ripples of change that started with a black boy's journey from the South Side of Chicago. Yeah. See, my story is simply a testament to the transformative power of mentorship and exposure. Through the lens of palm trees, I've shown that every young life, no matter where it begins, has the potential to grow tall and strong, reaching for the skies. As I reflect on this remarkable journey, let us be inspired to be mentors, to expose, and to plant the seeds of hope in the hearts of those who need it. For in the shadow of a palm tree, dreams take root. Yeah. And the human spirit blossoms against all odds. And like we say in Champs, you are born to win in every situation in life. Thank you for your time. Woo! Hearing their stories is what makes it memorable and motivating. So take your programs home, look up all, what all these guys are doing.